I try to be in 20 minutes so that we have some time for discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas L. Friedman, the famous New York columnist, already said 20 years ago, there are two superpowers left in the world today, the United States and Moody's. The United States <laughs> can destroy you by dropping bombs, and Moody can destroy you by downgrading your bonds. And believe me, it is not clear sometimes who is more powerful. <laughs> I'm not going to, to talk about rating agencies today, but from the perspective of an investor, the delisting of a company can be as powerful as Moody's in destroying your stocks. So the question <coughs> of how shareholders can be protected effectively in the case of a voluntary delisting, I'm only talking about voluntary delistings in the following, has occupied legal scholars in Germany for at least 10 or 15 years. Late last year, German legislator tackled the problem and regulated the requirements for a delisting. Bearing in mind the content and method of a legislator's invention, the following questions have to be answered. Do the provisions satisfy the interests, <coughs> do the, uh, provisions satisfy the interests of the shareholders? In this regard, we especially have to consider if it is uh, appropriate to revoke the requirement of a shareholder meeting in the case of a delisting. And is a state-made provision, after all, the best way to solve this problem? Maybe a soft law approach based on the competition of the listing rules would be a more suitable approach. In, this in the following, I would like to uh, approach this question by first giving you a short overview of the historical development in Germany and when discussing with the legislators' uh, reason for intervening. After all, I will outline the essentials of a new provision and take a critical look on the method. But let me begin by describing the conflict of the context of a delisting. In a company uh, with a stock exchange listing, is usually uh, the company's uh, listing is usually very important for the shareholders. It guarantees them an easy transferability of their shares and uh, high transparency requirements so that they have constant and cheap information about the company's activities. This is why we're also calling the delisting getting dark, because you get out of the screen of uh, analysts and things like that. And on the other hand, the management has often a big interest in a delisting because they can save money by that and they can act free of public control. Also, the major shareholder can be interested in a delisting to gain private advantages and may use his influence on the managers, uh, the management. Whilst delisting is a matter of corporate governance in a wide sense. If the management seeks the delisting, the shareholders can only choose between staying in a non-listed corporation and selling their stocks. Usually, after the delisting, the sole potential buyer will be the, ma the majority shareholder who can therefore keep the price low. The need to protect the shareholders under these circumstances is generally accepted. Controversial are only the proper way of <coughs> the uh, intensive of the protection. By way of illustration, I will now shortly sum up the uh, historical development in Germany for a better understanding. <coughs> so a voluntary delisting had only been possible in Germany since 1998. At that time, the German legislator implemented in the Stock Exchange Act in Germany the possibility of a voluntary delisting on the request of the issuer. However, he did not set any standards for the protection of the investors, but rather uh, <coughs> left the issues to the stock exchange and their respective listing rules. According to these listing rules, the most stock exchange in Germany, where are seven at the moment, and there have been eight in former times, a delisting was only allowed if a takeover was submitted to all shareholders beforehand. The dispute <coughs> of the uh, prerequisites of the delisting arose when Frankfurt Stock Exchange, that is the largest financial hub in Germany, removed the requirement of the takeover from its listing rules in March 2002. From then on, a delisting only required a lock weight of six months between the decision to delist the company and the execution of the delisting. During this lock weight, shareholders can sell their stocks. 
The change in Frankfurt <coughs> was the starting signal for a competition of different listing rules between the different German stock exchange. But already in November 2002, the German Federal Court of Justice decided that a lock weight is not enough to, pre to protect the investors. On contrary, a delisting does not only require a take offer, but also a resolution of the shareholders' meeting. Ten years later, in 2013, Federal Court of Justice unexpectedly overruled his judgment of 2002 and decided that, after all, a mere lock weight between the announcement and the execution of a delisting is enough to meet the requirements of an effective investor protection. No compensation and no participation of a shareholder meeting were required any longer. As a consequence of this judgment, the majority of the German stock exchange, especially Frankfurt, returned to the old liberal standards. The decision of the Federal Court of Justice was severely criticized not only by investors' representatives, but also by many legal and economic scholars in Germany and in other parts of Europe. They argued that the announcement of a delisting normally leads to a big plunge of a price. <coughs> the Federal Court of Justice, which had denied a negative price effect of a delisting, was blamed to have based a decision on a false empirical study. German Member of Parliament followed this reasoning when they first discussed delisting in May 2015, nearly a year ago, and in September the Parliament implemented a mandatory takeover offer, although there had been no profound empirical studies at that time. Before discussing the new uh, provision in detail, I would like to take <coughs> uh, uh, I would like to take a closer look on the legislator's reason for intervening. Therefore, it is necessary to face the legal and the empirical facts. So let's start me with the empirical facts. The Federal Court of Justice has based a change in the jurisdiction on an empirical study from 2012 on market reaction or to the announcement of a delisting. According to this study, the announcement of a delisting does not cause any negative price effects, but the survey only analyzed the listings between 2001 and 2009. During this period, according to the ruling of the Federal Court of Justice, a delisting required a takeover offer. It can be assumed that the prospect of a cash settlement has stabilized the market rates. So at that time, negative price effects could not be expected. Hence, the study from 2012 is no proof. Um, for the hypothesis that delisting causes no financial disadvantages to the shareholders. Then in January 2015, we had a new study that was published. It surveys the price reaction of delisting in the period after the second decision of the Federal Court of Justice and concludes that the announcement of a delisting leads a price DC lines an average of 20% in single cases up to 80%. The study caused a great steer amongst the politician and the public in Germany and was a proof as the unaffectiveness of the Federal Court of Justice judgment in 2013. Surely the survey also influenced the decision of German legislator. But the new study also shows severe methodical problems. First of all, it does not distinguish between the withdrawal from a regulated market and the withdrawal of a delisting of an open market. Further examinations have proven that especially the open market delisting causes substantial price losses. But since the open market is less regulated in Germany, companies have always been allowed to delist without a takeover offer. The Federal Court of Justice uh, 2002 verdict had no impact on the open market. In other words, this survey uh, mistakes apples and oranges. Soiled and scientifically sound surveys have only been published since September 2015. That means after the legislator has already done his decision. They also conclude that the withdrawal from the regular market leak, uh, leads to a dropping price. However, they observed <coughs> that the DC lines only have an amount of 5 up to 10% on average. 
All in all, we have to conclude that the real delisting are rather rare and usually do not cause a collapse of the price. But a lock weight cannot prevent the shareholders from the loss of 5 up to 10% of their capital. So, the shareholder have to show, so does the shareholder have to tolerate this loss or was there in fact the need for intervening by the legislator? The answer can only be found by weightening up the interests. As mentioned before, the stock exchange listing is very important for the most shareholders. This especially is true for all shareholders who usually pursue only the investment purpose with their holdings. So they decide exit if they don't like the uh, company any longer. Additionally, the delisting is accompanied by the secession of virus disclosure requirements, such as a stock disclosure or other disclosure like financial reporting standard for stock listed companies. The shareholders still have the right to demand information in the shareholders' meeting, but de facto they lose the more important possibility to inform themselves via financial intermediaries because security analysts, rating agencies usually do not care about a non-listed company. On the other hand, there can be no doubt that the issuer has a wild interest in being allowed to a voluntary end of a listing. A listing costs numerous duties and therefore can be quite expensive. If the average of the listing no longer overrides the costs, the listing is economically reasonable and should be prevented. For example, a company may be able to raise funds more cheaply by at financial powerful investors. It is conceivable that the market for company shares is already so illiquid that the placing of new shares produces capital unpromising. In this case, the shareholder need for protection is significantly lower because even before the delisting, the possibility of selling their shares via stock exchange was limited due to the illiquidity. On the top of that, all shareholders <coughs> benefit from the company gain and value. But often, <coughs> a delisting is pursued by the major shareholder who expect private advantages from the cessation, for example, the increase of control. <coughs> In the recent past, several companies also used the easing of delistic, delisting requirements for a cheap squeeze out of small shareholders or minority shareholders. Especially under these circumstances, shareholders need to be protected. <coughs> And the efficiency of capital market depends on the investor's confidence in the market. Investor protection requirements are essential to gain this confidence. If the legislator wants to encourage investors to invest their capital in stocks, he has to make sure that he does not fear the loss of a substantial part of this money in case of a delisting. So all in all, there was a need for the legislator to intervene. He did not trust the competition of listing rules, and rightly so. So because I'm now going to run out of time, I will do my uh, further slides very quickly. I would now like to give you a brief overview on the new regulation came up in force in November 2015. The delisting is only possible under the condition of a mandatory takeover. There's only one exception if the shares are still traded in the regulated market in another German or European stock exchange. So if you are still listed at an open market, that is not enough and you have to pay this uh, takeover. So that is stronger than we discussed it before. <coughs> Consideration uh, in this uh, takeover bit has to be paid in cash, has to be monetary. And the amount of this uh, compensation is uh, <coughs> collected by the average weight of the market price of the last six months before the announcement of the delisting. So we don't have to ask for the real enterprise value that was uh, <coughs> suitable under the judgment of 2002. There are only two exceptions. I only mention them very briefly. If the issuer has violated a legal obligation like uh, a top disclosure or did a market price manipulation, then we have to go back to the real enterprise value. And the same came up uh, when we had a very illiquid market and there had been no uh, trade in the last days before the announcement. 
Um, another point is that the legislator said we need no resolution of shareholder meeting. It's not necessary any longer. So now, in my last step, I would take a short critical evolution of this new provision. Um, <clears throat> the first question is, do we need a shareholder, uh, <clears throat> do we need the involvement of a shareholder's meeting in the context of the delisting? In my opinion, no, we do, not, we do not need that because the shareholders' meeting is competent for all issues concerning fundamentals of the company. But is the delisting a fundamental of the company? No, it is only a financial consequence for the investors, but it does not change the structure of the company. The company is still a stock exchange with the board and with the shareholder meeting and so on. And delisting neither changes the company structure, I already mentioned that. Um, and the shareholders all, uh, also have still their voting rights, their dividend rights, and so on. So the question could only be whether we could compare a delisting to other uh, acts like a squeeze out or a change in legal form where we need the uh, shareholders meeting and the resolution of the shareholder meeting. So can we compare a delisting to a squeeze out? I think no, because the economic uh, conclusion to de-invest is not similar to a legal force. So we have only a de facto uh, effect for the uh, investors to sell their stocks. Is there <coughs> a, a parallel between the delisting and the change of the legal form? I think no as well, because the stock exchange is still a stock exchange, uh, uh, the uh, stock company is still a stock company. We have special uh, rules that address listed uh, stock companies, but they have no uh, total different influence on the company. And it's still another thing, uh, if you change, for example, from a stock corporation to a limited company with a total other governance. So in my understanding, delisting is not a fundamental issue, and we do not, uh, do not need to involve the shareholder meeting. Um, <coughs> When there is another special uh, German problem, we call that the predatory shareholders. Predatory shareholders always file an action against the resolution of a shareholder meeting, and after getting a big financial benefit, they drop their action. And so if we uh, <coughs> ask for the participation of a shareholder meeting, we have uh, to fear that these predatory shareholders file actions against the delisting. Um, my last point is whether it was good to make a state provision or whether we should have count on the competition of listing. The competition of listing rules, as we saw, was uh, enforced between uh, 2002 and 2003. But instead of an increase of investor protection, we saw a race to the bottom because the management of Frankfurt Stock Exchange, who is the big player in the market, tried to attract the issuers with liberal delisting requirements. And the problem with the competition of listing rules is always that the investors are not interested in the listing rules in the moment they buy their shares. They are only interested in, uh, in very low uh, trans transaction prices, and they only look on this point, and then after they have bought the shares, they suddenly see, okay, now we have a delisting, now we have a problem. So I do not count uh, on the competition of these uh, listing rules. So all in all, in my opinion, <coughs> the German legislator has done right by uh, build up this strong uh, investor protection in the case of uh, uh, delisting. So if you keep all this in mind, in my opinion, uh, the delisting is not as that powerful as Moody can be by destroying your stocks. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I can just say absolutely perfect timing. Thank you very much, Matthias. You're welcome. It's typical of German precision, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he told me very open via email, do not speak longer than 20 minutes. <laughs>
no share, you justified the fact that no shareholder uh, uh, approval is required uh, in the case of, uh, and that you mentioned that it was, it, it's not considered to be a squeeze out. Mm -hmm. But if, if one of the problems in the past was that that was used, the voluntary delisting, mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. way of getting rid of mm -hmm. certain shareholders and minority shareholders, how come that you don't see that any longer <coughs> under the legislation and that you justify the fact yeah, yeah. that uh, it's not, it's, it's not, it could not be seen yeah, as yeah. a squeeze out? Mm -hmm. Well, you're totally right. We, we saw that sometimes, but not in, in general. And now the question is, what is the benefit of a participation of a shareholder meeting? Uh, under the judgment of 2002, a uh, shareholder meeting had to say yes or no to the listing with a majority of 50%. But as we have normally a majority shareholder, he will say yes, we are going to delist, and here's 50% or more. So now we can talk about uh, a higher quorum, like uh, 75 or whatever, yeah? but you need a very, very high quorum if you want to protect the shareholders uh, via participation of a sh annual meeting. There's a question there. I'm not sure if this is a question more, more the sort of comment. Um, I'm going to announce that I'm seriously thinking about delisting my company. <laughs> I haven't broken the law. I've been entirely accurate, and I am indeed thinking about it. So the share price goes down. And as long as I keep on letting people know that, if I'm patient, in six months' time, I will have reduced the price for the takeover. Um, so you either stop people doing that, which would be rather odd, or you accept the fact that occasionally a company is going to be bought at slightly uh, lower prices than you possibly might have expected. The other thing I would say is when you delist a company, you do change shareholder rights. Because one of the things that I was also going to do when I delisted uh, is I'm going to be, because I'm a majority shareholder, now I'm going to sell almost all of the assets of my company to my brother and then that would be a related party transaction under most listing rules applying in a number of different jurisdictions. Um, and so therefore, that I would be prevented from voting on that if it were a listed company. But of course, because it's no longer a listed company, then I can do that. And so therefore, I can just rip the company effectively out from underneath uh, the bottom of all the other shareholders. So I would say that there, is, there are circumstances where you can change uh, uh, the rights. Um, but actually, it's worse than that because speaking as a regulator, depending upon the maths, you can actually get a situation where if you do a takeover, but you don't get the threshold for squeeze out, normally let's say 90, 90%, unfortunately you th may then also trigger another requirement in relation to regulated markets in the UK and the similar provisions uh, here, regulated markets in Europe, so I should say, and the similar provisions here, that there has to be a public float of at least 25%. Now, there have been occasions where companies have done a takeover deal um, and they've got 80% effectively. Um, uh, fortunately, then the regulator comes along and says, you no longer have sufficient public float. What are you going to do about that? And the person who's just bought 80% of the company says, I'm not going to do anything about that. Uh, well, with a uh, face with that sort of intransigence, the regulator does the only thing it can do, which of course is uh, delist the company at which point the major shareholder says, thank you very much, that's what I was trying to do in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are serious problems with delisting and there are no obviously right answers. Mm. I'm not sure that a legislative provision is demonstrably much better. Well, thank you for this comment. I mean, there was nearly a second uh, segment. Uh, very briefly, uh, I agree that there are still possibilities uh, to destroy the value of the stock price beforehand. Um, so I did not say that uh, the solution we found in Germany is perfect, but at least it helped to solve the problem a little bit. And you're totally right. We have to took a different uh, look on very small enterprises with uh, huge majority shareholders and only a very small free float that are typical uh, cases of delisting in the open market. Um, but we saw also delistings of companies with still a big free float. And I think at least in these cases, 
would take over a bit this uh, a chance to protect to protect the investors. Right, we'll have uh, one, two, two more questions. Just first, uh, Uma Khan, and then and Junai, then and then we'll present that, that chart. So, uh, uh, speak with me now. Thank you. Very, very quickly, uh, you know, just following on the, uh, the, uh, the point that was made a little earlier, <coughs> it seems like uh, if we go across the continuum example, I think there's takeovers, then there's delisting, and there's squeeze out. So I think the arguments that you're making probably work best in a takeover situation. But from the takeover, once we start moving towards delisting and squeeze outs, I think it becomes a fundamental transaction for the reasons earlier mentioned. And it might require uh, shareholder approval because you're changing the nature of a company from something that only requires a shareholder whether to, uh, to decide whether to sell or not, rather than to approve the transaction itself. And the second point, very briefly, uh, the, you mentioned about you know the majority shareholder anyway has the approval uh, rights. Uh, that can be addressed, and it, it is so in, uh, in some of the countries in this region where you keep the majority shareholder outside the picture, and you get only the minority shareholders to vote through a majority of the minority on whether delisting or squeeze out should be approved or not. So that would be one way of addressing it as well, but it seems like it could be potentially something that's fundamental. Should we take another question? Uh, okay. uh, you know, uh, following your resume, uh, maybe your thinking is this way, we could not trust the board for terms of the delisting decision. So let's trust the general meeting of shareholders. However, we do not trust the majority shareholder. Maybe we should increase the quorum from 50% to 75%. And then you know, we should trust the legislature. But I do not trust the legislature. Sometimes they're very slow uh, in terms of efficiency. Sometimes they are limited in their wisdom. So I'm more interested in the German court of justice in offering some uh, judicial remedies to the dissenting minority shareholders who suffers from the delisting. Would you please give me some uh, uh, examples of the court decisions or some arguments of the judges in Germany? Thank you. Okay, um, starting with the second question, uh, one main argument, I left that out to make it not too complicated, was uh, that we have to protect the shareholder as the real owner of the company and when Federal Court of Justice said this is uh, the protection of property that is guaranteed by our Constitution, and they, they took that argument uh, to build up a high protection of the shareholders. And when we had another decision, I left that out for time reasons as well, from our Constitutional Court a year before uh, Federal Court of Justice overruled his own judgment. And he said, well, you can do that, Federal Court of Justice. It's all fine, this protection of the shareholder, but do not uh, say it has to be done under the uh, Constitution and the protection of property. You, you can do that via company law, maybe, yeah, and you can discuss that, but you're not forced to. And then he overruled. Uh, the second point is, yes, you are right. Um, if the majority shareholder uh, dropped the price, that was his argument as well, then we may have remedies uh, uh, to, uh, against the uh, minority shareholders, and then they can try to build up an action. But that is quite difficult because they have to uh, say what is their loss, yeah? and, and, and the, the process is very complicated, very long. So I still think that this uh, solution the German legislator now has chosen, that is something like a capital market approach, and not a uh, company law approach, is uh, at least the right reaction to try uh, to solve this problem. But as I already mentioned, I do not think uh, that we can solve all situations and that it is a perfect solution. So perfect solutions in this world are very rare. Uh, is this not a fascinating example of an area that's being regulated softly at one stage mm. and that this uh, soft regulation is becoming harder and harder uh, and it's interesting and it will probably set examples uh, for other jurisdictions as well over time. Uh, I would really like to thank um, Matthias for an excellent presentation. Thank you for staying so very much on time and let us put our hands together. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs>